Good morning, everyone. Good evening, others who are joining in from India. And good afternoon to those who are joining in from Europe. Welcome, everyone, to this conversation on what's going to shape 2021 for the CPG industry from a technology transfer point of view. I'm joined here by two eminent speakers and leaders from the industry. I'll first introduce Kevin Gokey, global CIO of Church and White. He leads the comprehensive information technology agenda for the company. And prior to becoming CIO, Kevin held roles of increasing responsibility with Church and Dwight, covering all IT domains. He has more than 35 years of industry experience, and he has held leadership roles in the consumer products, IT consulting, financial services, electrical electronics, and medical industries. Prior to his tenure with Church and Dwight, Kevin has held leadership positions with Siemens, with Payne Weber, National Westminster Bank, Revlon, and Thomas and & Betts. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you, Paul. Happy to be here. Hello to everybody, wherever you are. Thanks, Kevin. And I have the pleasure of introducing Praveen. Praveen is with Microsoft. He is uh, with the retail and consumer goods industry solutions team. And he has spent a life working with unified commerce, retail store operations, personalization, customer analytics, and also, by the way, the old world ERP provision. So um, welcome to the show. You lead retail and consumer goods industry solutions mm -hmm. and develop solutions to help retailers and CPGs innovate and transform their businesses. Very happy to have you here, Praveen. Welcome. You're muted, Praveen. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, this needed to happen. Uh, happy to be here and part of the fireside chat. Hello, everyone. Thank you. So we'll get this going. You know, let me kick off the conversation with something that's um, been very much in our uh, from ITC. This is in ITC Infotech. My name is Paul, and. Uh, I will introduce the topic uh, with something that we have been seeing uh, really impacting us in the last, especially 12 months, where uh, there have been such dramatic changes in industry. New consumer segments have been emerging almost every other day. And industries obviously responded with so many new uh, product launches, innovations that have uh, fundamentally changed the character of our industry. And what that tells us is that organizations really have this uh, urgent need to uh, change the way they have uh, operated in the past. Today, they have a far greater need to be connected in real time with consumers and with employees and with their internal functions. So externally with consumers and that translating to internal connectedness as well in real time. So let me ask Praveen uh, for your thoughts first as a cloud um, transformation organization, you have been in the thick of things in the last 12 months. You have really seen the world go upside down, right? So uh, in your world, how does real-time connectedness resonate with what you are seeing with retail and CPG? Yeah, yes, Paul. Uh, if you look at the consumer goods landscape, right, it's changing faster than ever before. So it's not very wrong to say that CPG companies have been a bit behind when it comes to digital transformation uh, in comparison to the retailers. But the global pandemic uh, kind of we experienced last year has uh, accelerated the need for digital transformation. So we have seen the resilience and the ingenuity the organization have shown to quickly grow and adapt during the pandemic has been amazing. And uh, in the words of our CEO, Satya Nadella, so he explains this as we have seen two years worth of transformation in the space of two months. Mm -hmm. So talking about digital innovation, so here is a slide I would love to share, which kind of shows the uh, transformation forces that are reshaping CPG organizations. Let me know when you can see the screen. Coming up, I guess coming up okay but i'll start talking about a uh, few of them so um one of one of them that we are seeing is again right so due to the pandemic how can we quickly digitize and move the customers onto the cloud 
so that they can start reducing cost and uh, improving their business operations uh, and business processes. So that has been uh, top of the mind for a lot of our leaders. And then there are other opportunities that we are seeing around direct to consumer. So how can CPG companies build a direct channel of engagement with their consumers, get insights into their shopping behaviors, um, spot new trends, and then build loyalty and brand affinity so that they understand the new segments that are evolving, as you mentioned earlier. The second, uh, the biggest key focus is optimizing supply chain, is to get end-to-end -end supply chain visibility across the value chain. How can you digitize the process, build transparency, and then reduce operational cost and manage inventory accurately, given all uh, the external factors and influences uh, uh, that they need to consider. And the third one is uh, the e-commerce platform. So we have seen during the pandemic that the online sales has grown uh, more than 200%. So B2B, B2B2C, to serve uh, uh, second tier and third tier, third tier customers, is will be a growing opportunity that we see. And then uh, it even provides the opportunity to have a low barrier entry point into emerging mar markets. Finally, as we look at all of these, right? So every company has ESG goals and sustainability has been part of uh, the CXO agenda now. It's part of the PNL. So as you are digitizing the process, how can you track, monitor, and report on the ES ES uh, ESG goals? So these are a couple of uh, kind of the transformational forces that we are seeing in CPG. And from a Microsoft point of view, um, so as we start having these conversations with goods industries and then help them embark in their digital transformation journey to create a connected, agile, and data-empowered organization, there are four industry priority scenarios that we anchor towards to help them uh, uh, identify what business outcomes and capabilities that they want to achieve. The first is around optimized brand performance. This is mainly focused on how can you create connected consumer experience to increase marketing effectiveness and drive omnichannel commerce. Uh, because today we know uh, CPG companies spend a lot uh, uh, on their marketing dollars, but the ROI is in single digits. So how can you drive uh, uh, agility and then data-driven insights to have the right marketing um, marketing optimization across all your touch points. Second is connecting your enterprise. So this is to bring uh, intelligent uh, connectivity and connect um, uh, collaboration and productivity tools uh, to empower the entire ecosystem from your suppliers, from your uh, HQ to your warehouse to the field sellers so that you are improving speed to market, improving sales execution, and then uh, uh, shopper and consumer satisfaction. The third pillar is uh, deliver sustainable and operational ex uh, excellence. So this has uh, the, this has two areas that we cover. One is around factory of the future. How can you have a connected factory to improve yield and reduce uh, operational cost uh, and manual labor? And two is around uh, digitizing your end-to-end -end supply chain and logistics to have a better visibility on what's happening from your uh, uh, replenishment to distribution to uh, uh, making sure that your product reaches the right um, customer at the right point in time. And the last but not the least is uh, accelerate innovation. So this is helping consumers um, transform their traditional product building to move to move move towards more a service kind of business model like how can you create product as a service or servitization as a business so that you are creating new business model and new revenue streams so as as you saw right so these caters across building that connective connected tissue across the organization and helping them automate and digitize their current processes yeah, Praveen, and the way I read it is as follows. You're talking really of, um, you know, not just operational excellence in the, you know, on your third pillar, you're really tying it with sustainability. You're also tying it with uh, the way that the brand actually appears and therefore how does it really convey those uh, innovations that you're uh, bringing in. You've spoken about connecting the entire enterprise um, and uh, all of these really have to happen in uh, far great at far greater speed as compared to before. Let me uh, check with Kevin. How are you seeing all of this emerge in the CPG industry? You have been 
uh, at the forefront of a lot of change yourself. Uh, what is your take, Kevin? Yeah, so, uh, you know, Paul, as we prepared for this session, I've said to Praveen more than once that uh, all of his message resonates with me and what we're focused on and doing at Church and Dwight. You just mentioned, uh, you said uh, operational excellence and the operational excellence that got us where we are today won't get us to the future. And the pandemic has done nothing to, uh, to slow that down. It, all it's done is, is reinforce uh, that the expectations are changing, uh, behaviors changing, things like, um, you know, e-commerce, BOPIS, which is, you know, buy online, pick up in store. We, um, we have to respond to that. Um, the consumer experience and understanding the consumers has always been very difficult in uh, um, the manufacturing space in CPG because the primary uh, owner of the relationship is the retailer, our customer. Uh, so D2C is a big element for us so that we can have a relationship with the consumer uh, and understand their behaviors and then multiply that out for the entire consumer segment. Uh, it's a way for us to test and learn uh, new ideas on products. Um, we're feeling pressure to uh, connect our supply chain end to end to create the visibility um, to our customers, some of whom are starting to expect that, um, that they can see through our entire supply chain in real time. Uh, so I could go on and on, but um, the point uh, here is that all of this resonates and it's uh, pretty much everything we're talking about is something we're, we're not just considering, but that we're working on. And when you uh, refer to D2C, is that something that, um, Kevin, you see happening globally? How, what is your perspective? Or is that, um, you know, more localized in uh, the more Western economies? Uh, the majority of our direct-to-consumer uh, sites and our selling is North America, uh, Western Europe, and Australia. Um, and it's not a significant segment of revenue for us, and that's not primarily not what it's about. What it's about is, is being able to communicate with the end consumer, being able to test things out, uh, right. being able to build a data set of those consumers. But yeah, we're, we're not as established in Asia, for instance, as a company, and most of our sales in other parts of the world that I didn't just list go through third parties. We don't have a, our own presence there. And to be honest, the disruptions that the supply chain has seen uh, in the last one year, you uh, on the one hand don't know where demand will come from. On the other, uh, you're completely uncertain about um, how the uh, you know, products will ship uh, and reach the stores and the consumers. Um, what helped you, um, uh, you know, deal with that? And what do you see will be a trend for the coming year, Kevin? Well, um, the, you know, the, the primary focus for us is, as I said already, you know, we're heavily focused on supply chain, um, uh, end to end visibility. Um, you know, we're, we're also looking to do things like, uh, you know, joint business planning with the retailers. Um, and, uh, you know, it just, it, I don't want to generalize, but it, uh, it, you know, it covers the whole thing. You know, one of the things that I didn't touch on as well is as e-commerce. And when I say e-commerce, most of that is uh, walmart.com or amazon.com becomes a, a more significant uh, portion of our revenue. And it's, it's pretty significant already, but it, uh, we anticipate it will continue to become um, bigger and bigger over the next number of years. Uh, being able to serve the, you know, the omni channel to succeed in store uh, and also online goes all the way back into packaging and, and product ideation. And, uh, you know, so it covers the gamut, Paul. And if I were to uh, just therefore probe you one step further, um, you know, by the way, uh, whoever's in the audience, please do type in your questions. Uh, in the chat box and we're happy to take your questions anywhere, anytime in course of the uh, conversation. Please do go ahead and uh, type in your questions. Uh, Kevin, coming back to what I was asking you, uh, with regard to uh, what helps you succeed with those uh, supply chain challenges that uh, you were just referring to, um, it really requires a completely new way of looking at the data architecture. So. Uh, mm -hmm. 
you know, let me probe you once on what you are seeing as reality and an imperative for this year before we go uh, speak with mm -hmm. Praveen again. Yeah, so you know, real time data data is something we haven't really touched on that much yet. And, um, you know, it's not a surprise that uh, we're a, a, a big Microsoft shop and heavily invested in Azure and Azure's data capabilities and uh, being able to leverage uh, you know um, data for advanced analytics uh, to optimize our trade investment and work better with our customers as partners and uh, you know look for win wins for both of them. Um, for you know, um, Praveen mentioned uh, uh, yield uh, in manufacturing. So again, that's a, a heavy data element for us. Uh, so we've made a significant investment in the last number of years in an analytics capability, uh, data science, advanced analytics. It's it is Microsoft centric, uh, but that is a key bet for us in this next uh, twelve uh, and beyond months uh, for us to succeed. Sure. And, um, you know, by the way, I noticed that Praveen got dropped. Uh, we'll have him back. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know, as you spoke about Microsoft, we had him uh, disappear. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I couldn't help but observe. Uh, from your point of view, uh, Kevin, uh, you know, the Microsoft stack obviously uh, helps you um, accelerate your journey in multiple ways, right? There is a platform. Uh, advantage that you get get by adopting uh, let's say mm -hmm. Azure uh, for your data journey. What is your thinking with regard to um, uh, you know the traditional way of uh, really create treating each project as an independent silo as compared to dealing with transformation with a, a platform orientation? Do you see uh, do you see your approach changing, evolving uh, in course of uh, this year? Yeah. So, um, you know what what we're talking about is the um, the implicit uh, capability of a platform versus siloed uh, approach. Um, you know the the fact that we've based as much as we can in the future in the Microsoft Cloud and Azure uh, avails us. Uh, to leverage the tools that are, uh, you know, part of the underpinning of Azure um, and exploiting the capabilities vis-a-vis uh, -vis our data. Uh, so more, more and more, our platform, our strategy going forward is is platform centric as opposed to, you know, islands uh, of technology. Uh, that's a journey. So we intend to make uh, pro continued progress on it uh, this year, uh, since we're trying to focus on this year. And you know what we're focused on is taking uh, data marts and siloed reporting systems out of our ecosystem and collapsing collapsing them into our Azure Data Lake, for exactly what we're talking about. So that's a journey that we're on as well. And when you think of the data lake, uh, one obvious question is, uh, with regard to the readiness for your business to really deal with what comes out of the data lake, right? It is great to have. Um, mm -hmm the incoming uh, flow of data, but how do you see that uh, part of the journey, the transformation that business needs to undertake? Uh, what's been your experience? Yeah, so um, the technology and the data are not as hard as the people. Um, getting people uh, to be data literate, um, we have, uh, you know, for instance, in my company, we have a lot of people with an analyst title in their in their job title, but I I would posit that they spend the majority of their time trying to move data around and organize it in a fashion that uh, they can do something with. Um, so the, the the one platform approach and having data in one place means that we're going to expect those people to be able to do something with the data, to glean insights, and to make recommendations. So that's the toughest part of the journey that we're on is to right. skill them and change their attitude towards what they do uh, uh, to actually be more data science uh, than data jockeys, if you will. So uh, I think that's really important. Getting the organization ready, in other words, is the hardest part of what we're talking about. Yeah. Let me uh, see if uh, Praveen can hear us. Praveen, if you can hear us, we can't see you yet, uh, but you seem to be back uh, in the session. Uh, can you hear us, Praveen? Could you please respond?
Okay, no, we don't hear him. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so uh, this is uh, this is something that uh, Kevin. We have well, it always goes like this, right? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. we become far more patient uh, with all of this, isn't it? So, uh, you know, in the past, uh, we wouldn't have been so forgiving <laughs> of each other. <laughs> yeah. We've all gotten, gotten used to this type of uh, problem this past year. Right, absolutely. So, yeah, you're speaking of um, you know, the people challenges and the, uh, you know, that being a greater uh, part of the uh, journey as compared to just technology. If you can uh, just amplify that um, and say, you know, your transformation really has been uh, with a strong focus on AI as well. Are there um, uh, any instances, Kevin, that you can take of how AI has been used in your organization and what do you see the journey for the future? Sure. So, you know, some of the, the more rudimentary elements of artificial intelligence are things like robot, robotics, uh, process automation. So, we, you know, we started there. It uh, looks like they're, they're trying to add uh, Praveen back in, by the way. Uh, yeah. we, you know, we started there uh, at the more fundamental level, which is uh, using robots to uh, automate routine processes. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they, they go all the way up to uh, using um, artificial intelligence to, to do things like scrape the web and look for, uh, to do analytics, to look for product counterfeits uh, around the world, something that, oh, he's back. Uh, something um, that you know, we, yeah. <laughs> we lose a lot of revenue annually, uh, like all companies do with uh, product, uh, counterfeit products. And, you know, we've, we've leveraged uh, the capabilities in, in the Azure stack to, to search for and identify uh, um, counterfeit products and take them take them off the digital shelf, if you will. Uh, so, you know, I could go on and on, but those are a couple examples. Praveen, welcome back. Thank you. I don't know what happened. I got disconnected and I just couldn't jo join back. So Praveen, while you were away, we uh, were speaking about uh, the platform orientation that uh, I think has taken hold firmly uh, in most mm -hmm. Organizations' transformation journeys um, yeah. would like to check. Uh, you know, have your uh, view on what are you seeing um, uh, coming in uh, terms of business value that is being delivered through uh, primarily uh, your know, cloud-driven platformization in uh, enterprise mm -hmm. uh, technology landscape. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I think the four biggest area of inv investment that we are seeing in the CPG space by IT leaders are one, as Kevin was mentioning earlier, right? So around data analytics and uh, data platform uh, transformation. So creating that data estate foundation to kind of break the barriers across the line of businesses, whether it's uh, finance, whether it's sales, whether it's product development uh, um, and marketing is to see how you can start bringing all the brand and all the brands and the data estate together and applying AI and machine learning capabilities to drive predictive insights. So it can be to reduce cost and uh, op um, optimize operations. When it comes to supply chain, how you can start uh, leveraging demand forecasting or price sensitivity, inventory management, uh, uh, AI machine learning capabilities to get better visibility and accuracy in the way you are, demand, uh, you are creating your forecasts. Uh, whether it's the sales forecast or the inventory forecast and the demand to make sure that it's aligning with your consumer needs. And uh, and uh, a lot of the places where we are seeing investment happening is around trade promotion optimization to see how we, how um, merchandisers can increase revenue and ROI and then work very closely and collaborate with retailers to drive uh, um, the products that our uh, customers are expecting uh, promotions or offers. Um, and the second area of investment is around security. As uh, the companies are moving into digital, so they want to invest in uh, cybersecurity and privacy 
of their customer data to ensure that uh, they are providing the level of transparency and they are, uh, uh, are adhering to the compliance requirement, whether it's GDPR or uh, uh, California Consumer Act, etc. And the third, uh, we talked about e-commerce, right? Uh, direct consumer channel to build relationship uh, with the end consumer. That's another big focus uh, area uh, where a lot of digitization is happening. And the last one is around process auto automation to elim eliminate manual labor. Um, so increased productivity, whether it's for trade promotion, sales executions, or any business processes. So these are, these are this, these are the areas where we are seeing a lot of investment happening, and we see that this is going to continue and grow in uh, 2021. Right. Sorry, Kevin. Please go ahead. I would, say, I would second what Praveen just said. We're we've made significant investments in um, analytics capabilities uh, to optimize trade investment. Uh, as we know, trade investment uh, in the CPG industry is, is a pretty significant amount of money. Uh, so how do we classify uh, and, um, you know, then use the data to, to predict uh, and recommend, really prescribe where we should uh, run promotions, you know, how, things like that. Um, uh, security is, is another one. Um, uh, as you were rejoining, Praveen, I was talking about low-end artificial intelligence, yeah. robotics process automation. Uh, mm -hmm. So all of what you said uh, is, is stuff that we're focused on. <clears throat> yeah, and um, one one thought, uh, Praveen, uh, Microsoft mm -hmm. went, um, I think, uh, uh, you know, one whole stage ahead with what you did with Kroger's, for instance, really taking dynamic pricing with uh, electronic shelf labels. Um, are you seeing such technologies really taking root? Will they become mainstream, you think, in the coming year? Yeah, we, we are seeing a lot of partnerships between CPG companies and retailers, right? So mainly trying to understand uh, as retailers are moving towards digitizing their uh, physical store formats, so we, there will be new opportunity and uh, new business models where the CPG companies and retailers really can collaborate. So with uh, smart shelves, uh, with the price sensitivity and the price competition that's happening, moving to ele electronic shelf label, which is cost effective, is the way to go. But there is still a lot of innovation that is pending there. And we are seeing new business models on how uh, camera and sensor technology can help enable understand uh, the customer demography, part to purchase, what products and um, what products and categories are being sold. So if these data can be monetized and shared back to CPG, it provides a lot of first party insights to manage the right level of assortment and the direct store delivery and sales execution. And at the same time, um, it, in, it enables uh, CPG companies to understand how their products are moving and how they can quickly innovate and bring uh, and increase the speed to market. So we like it, it is, it's a domino effect where uh, pricing and promotion within the store and even advertising is going to take off, but it's going to touch on a lot of other areas such as supply chain, uh, new product innovation, and then uh, customer engagement and how the employees interact with their customers. And if I were to uh, look at the impact that forecasting has had and Microsoft mm -hmm. itself, uh, has a fantastic story around how you have transformed your operations uh, with AI being used in forecasting. Do you see that becoming more mainstream? And what is the kind of business outcome that uh, CPGs can really look towards? Yeah. So I think with the sales forecasting and even the sales uh, for the sales forecasting, right? So we use a, a lot of uh, machine learning capabilities. Uh, for our sales representatives to understand what customers to focus on. So uh, using AI and machine learning to rank uh, by propensity, which customers would have the highest uh, revenue growth opportunities? What are the upsell and cross-sell opportunities uh, with the customer based on the historical uh, transactions and uh, taking into consideration the various products and services they are using with the, from within the Microsoft uh, ecosystem? So using all those capabilities as a seller now, they are informed to make the right decision on what are what are the areas to focus to drive the right conversation, what assets are, uh, uh, what information that we need to share with the customer to build the right level of relationship and then uh, accelerate the opportunities further. Uh, 
Looks like Paul is frozen now. Yeah. <laughs> Paul. Oh, I... He's moving again. Paul, are you back? I'm back. I can hear you. Okay. Can you? Awesome. OK, great. Yeah, yeah. fortunately, I, on this occasion, I could hear you right through. So. <laughs> Uh, super. So um, uh, I don't know if any uh, questions have uh, come in on the chat window. Uh, I haven't uh, yet had a chance to uh, see that. But in the meantime, yeah, I see that we lost uh, Praveen once more. Kevin, one question that <laughs> this goes on round robin. Yeah, Praveen is back. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, okay. Mm -hmm. One question that uh, I have for you, Kevin, just building on uh, the kind of instances that uh, 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 Pravin was um, uh, speaking about the business benefit uh, is really what you are accountable for as the CIO. Uh, ultimately, I presume that is what your CEO looks uh, at you for uh, enabling. Now, um, at the same time, you deal with partners like us. So there is a Microsoft, there is an ITC Infotech here in the room, uh, and there are so many more partners. Uh, do you see your job becoming even more challenging with so many partners at play, so many partnerships, both from a product and services and technology uh, point of view? How do you maybe look at delivering business value? Yeah, so, well, the, the reality is, uh, well, I would start by saying that most CIOs would prefer to work with as few um, providers as possible just to make their lives easy but we all realize that that's not practical. Uh, my ecosystem is made up of uh, probably about 100 different uh, suppliers, um, integrators and technology uh, software uh, and hardware companies. So um, I think it's important that uh, you identify a key subset of those um, uh, providers and you treat them like true partners. Uh, you open up um, to them, you show them your plans, you let them understand your um, your weaknesses and your opportunities, and uh, you know it, you turn it into a win for for both uh, both entities. It's joint business planning, except on the IT side is really what it is, right? I can't succeed if I don't have firms like ITC Infotech and Microsoft at the table working with me. Um, I just don't have the, the wherewithal to do it on my own. Uh, and, you know, the thing to keep in mind, and you're right, my, my job primarily is to make sure that we glean value um, from the things that we do that are enabled by technology. Uh, and my job is to translate the, the business uh, problems and needs into solves uh, that are technology centric. And, uh, Without my partners um, at the table, I have zero chance of uh, being successful at that. And that goes back to my, uh, you know, my my cloud-based as a service strategy. I have partners, uh, two of whom are on the phone uh, or on the call here, who are far better equipped technologically to deliver the results. And it's my job to to plug them in um, where I think they can uh, benefit us mutually. Did that answer your question, Paul? Yeah, and you know, one, one thing to, yes, yeah, sorry, one thing to add there, Paul, to like uh, just uh, uh, piling on what Kevin said, right? So when we work with our customers, it's always the business first and then the technology next, right? So mm -hmm. trying to understand the business landscape, what the aspiration of the customer is, uh, and how do we work with them as a strategic mm -hmm. partner to build out their two to three year uh, business plan. So which we call kind of the three horizon model from McKinsey, mm -hmm. trying to understand what the foundational pieces that we need to enable from a platform to help them uh, achieve on uh, optimizing their current operations and business capabilities and looking uh, on new uh, business models and new opportunities, which is horizon three, where they truly want to transform and be in the future. And then uh, translating that into consumable engagements and working through the partner ecosystem to start delivering value. So I think this is a kind of a bi-directional relationship that we need to have with the customer to start working very closely together and achieving the business value and the outcomes that the customer really needs. Right. Uh, so uh, 
you know where what i'm really uh, taking away is that there are so many different uh, forces at play uh, one could look at really um, uh, you know you spoke about saas providers uh, coming in uh, from uh, the point of uh, really bringing in many different technologies on a single platform uh, being able to promise a certain outcome pravin you spoke of a um, uh, completely different set of uh, elements if i may just ask a question you know being provocative here would you like kevin that uh, these different players somewhere uh, have the owners of somebody standing up and uh, saying that look kevin i am here to own up uh, the business outcome for you uh, and i'm here ready to put my skin in the game will that simplify your life Well, I don't I I can't say from a lot of experience that it would simplify my life, um but the prospect of that certainly uh is appealing. I, I'm I'm a I'm a technologist by background, but uh really what I am is a business person, so I I could say I don't really care how the technology uh is sourced, um how it's branded. I care about the outcome. uh the outcome that benefits uh church and dwight and you know one of the things i say all the time is there are no technology projects there are business projects with technology components um right cuz at the end of the day uh I, i'm just like everybody else it's the leader in the company i'm about driving the results so where a where a provider comes to me and says uh, i want to partner with you on an outcome based initiative i'm i'm all ears uh that is still not a highly prevalent model um uh you know a few of my suppliers talk to me about it and we've picked one or two uh areas but i don't have a ton of experience with it but i'm definitely intrigued by it great sorry for you and and a lot of the time right as being part of um uh, microsoft consulting services we see a lot of customers ask uh, directly mcs to be part of the engagements where it's too complex mm-hmm. too long um and uh, our emerging technology where we need uh, closer collaboration with our engineering teams so then we work uh, along with a partner and bring in uh, uh, sis gsis and partner ecosystem together so that we deliver the value mm-hmm. so so that's a way of having the skin in the game uh, where microsoft is directly involved and helping with uh, like lifting the heavy load that is required for the customer sure i'll take two questions that have come from the audience one uh, being uh, really referring to the challenge of monetizing legacy data and how are you seeing kevin um uh, that there is so much data that is lying with organizations which need not necessarily be very easily tapped uh, are you seeing any end in sight to that challenge Well, I, first of all, I, I would say I'm not in the business of directly monetizing data. Um if it can ultimately uh through, you know, uh, some sort of execution turn into monetization, great. Um I you know, I see the 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 challenge uh, as I said earlier, it's it's the people. Uh not only do I have legacy data if you will, so that could be ERP system transaction data that really a percentage of it is valuable in the type of experiments and work that uh, Praveen's been talking about uh for for instance trying to forecast your your supply chain uh demand or do some predictive uh, analysis for your sales folks on what they should be pushing um the problem goes beyond that because as we all know the data we're talking about we all have data warehouses in our environment and then we have the derived data that's in excel and access uh that the people i referred to earlier are actually using to do their jobs uh so i see it as a a significant uh inhibitor f- for us to achieve the progress at the pace that we started out talking about here so while i don't see it as a direct monetization initiative i see it as a huge challenge and a must do for us to get our data into one place get it standardized and have everybody working from that one source of truth not their version of the truth right so uh you know i think what you spoke about is so important and uh there is uh, 
possibly again going back to that point we made about the platformization that is really so important you really need to take that step else it is just individual islands of data that you keep creating and then they just lie there for the individual business owners to really tap the next question that i have praveen uh, is directed at uh, it's a question being asked of microsoft's uh, uh, perspective um, the question is there are so many uh, you know with regard to usage of ai uh, there are many intelligent assistants that we see in the marketplace uh, how do you see cpgs using uh, ai and intelligent assistants in the sales and trade uh, areas yeah intelligence assistance again if you look at the sales representative on merchandises today right so they are under a lot of pressure where they are serving a lot of customers and then they are they have no intelligence on uh, what products to sell how to upsell and cross sell how to increase revenue if you look at the big box uh, retailers usually like uh, the the opportunities of upsell and cross sell are limited but you can apply intelligence around how do i optimize my store visits depending upon uh, the opportunity with the customer like within this to within the store visit how do i uh, use cognitive services like camera to do uh, shelf audits compliance with planogram and then how can i uh, um, quickly like do uh, note taking which translates into actions for my next visit. So all, how all of these is kind of the digital feedback loop can come back into the system and provide me recommendation on the activities that need to be done. Like how can I get recommendations on the promotions that are running so that I can uh, have a more informed conversation with the store managers. So there are a lot of opportunities where you can start infusing AI into the business processes and make uh, the life uh, more efficient for the sales representatives who are in the field sure so there was another question that uh, came up with regard to um, joint business planning and collaboration between retailers and cpg kevin if i may uh, direct the question uh, to you um, the question is really about the opportunity to use analytics and ai in that space uh, what is the opportunity was the question, but let me layer another uh, on top of that. Um, you know, there is Microsoft, there's ITC Infotech here. Uh, so what would you want to see of uh, partners like us uh, being able to deliver in that area? What's the opportunity? Yeah, so um, again, you know, when, you, when you're talking traditional retail and you're talking, you know, trade and trade development and everything that Praveen just talked about, um, it's, a, it's a significant amount of investment. Uh, all of uh, our peer companies make, uh, Church and Dwight and all of our peers make, the ability to optimize um, the, whether it's the in-store time or the promotions, uh, and it needs to be done collaboratively with, uh, with the uh, the retailers that uh, we service with, those those need to be seen as partnerships. So, um, what I would ask uh, um, the ITCs and the Microsofts of the world, along with others that we work with, is to make it easier to get to um, an optimized set of recommendations that we can implement. Uh, it requires data from multiple sources, uh, your transaction systems, which in this case. Uh, ITC Infotech owns and operates for Church and Dwight. Um, you know, the advanced analytics that are in uh, platforms like uh, Azure. Um, and today it's, uh, it's not a uh, compact set of capabilities that are in one place. It requires, uh, it requires us to pull it together. And uh, if, you know, there were, um, offerings that um, where there were partnerships uh, the, that would be the kind of thing that would resonate with me great thank you very much kevin for that so we're down to the last one or two minutes um i think we've uh, not touched upon just one aspect that was uh, on my mind it was really related to kevin what you had spoken about while uh, uh, you know praveen was away so you had spoken about the people aspect of uh, change I think uh, there's a lot that uh, has to happen 
with regard to skilling and uh, really educating uh, organizations. So one last comment from both of you, uh, Kevin and Praveen, uh, as we wrap this up, what would you like to share and would you like to uh, touch upon the people aspect and aspect of really building talent for the future? Yeah, uh, how about I go first, Praveen? So, um, yeah. you know, for me, it starts with my team. Uh, I have uh, given them all homework this past last year and this year uh, and into the future uh, to up upskill themselves. We've given them requirements uh, around uh, cloud-based uh, capability training. No matter what walk of life you're in in IT, you're required to take it because everybody needs to be thinking about um, new ways of solving problems, not the traditional ways. Um, and then I think organizations need to figure out how they do some sort of lightweight investment in the broader uh, group of uh, employees in the company so that they understand what's possible and, and can be more readily moved away from the traditional ways that they're used to working. Um, and without those things, it, all we have is just another tool that we're spending money on that we're really not gleaning value from. So uh, I always say that people are the hardest part and we have a tendency to focus on the technology and getting that right. And we have a, um, an equal tendency to under invest our thoughts on how do we lead the people through change. And that might be easier in a technology company like an ITC Infotech or a Microsoft. It's a big challenge in a, in a company like mine, uh, which is a manufacturer of goods, right? We're not a technology company. So how do I get people ready to, to work in these new ways? And how do I have them by default think uh, about pursuing things in, in newer methods? That That's the key thing for me, the key takeaway. Probably yeah. Yeah. Most <laughs> No, I completely agree. I echo the same sentiment. Uh, it's adoption and change management, I think, is the biggest component in digital transformation, is showing the value of digitization and the tools that are being provided, right? And then getting the business users included early on in the process and understanding their journey, like understanding how they use the tools, where the blockers are, or where there is friction, and trying to solve that through technology so that they see the value and how easy it is to overcome through the new tools that are available for uh, the ease at which they can perform their day-to-day -day activities. Perfect. Thank you very much, Praveen and Kevin, for this fantastic conversation. We've covered a lot of ground in these 46 or 47 minutes that we have been on air. Love the conversation and look forward to carrying this on and having another one hopefully in a quarter from now. Thank you very much for the view. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for Thanks being here. Thank you having us. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Paul. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Good night and good day to everyone.